Good evening, everybody, and welcome to all our IRA members who are here in India and abroad. We are having our third lupus meeting, IRA webinar series today and tomorrow. And uh, Professor Bidud Dash from SCB Katak and Professor Renu Saigal from Jaipur, they will moderate the sessions. And uh, we have Professor David D. Cruz from St. Thomas's and Guy's Hospital London. And all of you are, uh, are, are, have seen him before as well. His contribution amazing. So hopefully we'll be having a wonderful lupus update uh, today and tomorrow. So may we, I request Professor Biddu Dash and Professor Renu Saigal to take up the podium and the start the proceedings. Good evening to you all. Uh, welcome to the third uh, IRA webinar on lupus. I must thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be a moderator in this session on a subject that is very dear to me. I've been working on lupus for a decade and a half. And uh, I feel we have all heard about uh, the emperor of maladies. If you have not read once, it's about cancer. And I fondly call lupus the empress of autoimmune diseases. I mean, that's what I tell my students, that it is something that you have to learn. And if you know lupus, you know your medicine very well. Uh, I think all of us have been chastened by the sobering realization how difficult it is to treat lupus because we face so many problems on the way. The heterogeneity of its presentation is bewildering and uh, our arsenal of treatment is pretty limited. I mean, we need to have more. And that's the reason why we are looking at the chinks in the armor so that we can target some of these uh, molecules or the cells which are called the pathogenetic targets which we can modulate so that we have more uh, drugs in our arsenal to treat. So it could be the innate immune system and I strongly believe the innate immune system will provide more answers in the future. There are many targets which have been discovered and also the adaptive immune system, both of them go hand in hand but I think the balance is slowly tilting towards the innate immune system in control of autoimmune diseases. The uh, uh, first speaker, Dr. Chengappa, will take us through a guided tour of these pathogenetic targets. He's a young and brilliant rheumatologist. Uh, he did his DM in immunology from Jipmer in 2017 at Puducherry. And he also in the same year had a specialty certificate uh, from rheumatology under the Federation of Royal College of Physicians, UK, and the British Society of Rheumatology. And is currently working as an assistant professor in clinical immunology at JITMER. He has won several awards, notably the second uh, prize in the annual National Rheumatology Quiz in 2016, and has also published many papers in the national and international journals. I hand over to Dr. Chengappa, you can carry on from now. So yep. today we have an interesting topic. I have an interesting topic and a challenging topic uh, to delineate some key pathogenic targets of lupus and looking into the future. So when we talk about future, how far into future are we staring? Because we have been listening to so many targets. We have been reading them for our exams and they have been disappearing from the market or they never make it to the market. So literally how far into the future are we looking at? It all started, the therapeutics at least started off in 19, 1894 when quinine extracts were first tried for cutaneous lupus. But the landmark was in 1950 when Philip Hench won the Nobel Prize for discovering cortisone, which then percolated from rheumatoid arthritis to so many autoimmune diseases. And we know that uh, glucocorticoids are really effective in most of our lupus patients. In 1954, it was Dubois who first used cyclophosphamide cytoxan for lupus. And there, was, there were a series of uh, drugs that were used between 1951 and 1967, including our favorite methotrexate, azathioprine and tacrolimus. But there was a hiatus till 1981 when cyclosporine was first used for lupus. And in 1992, the NIH landmark NIH trial for lupus nephritis was undertaken. And in 2003, it was a modified dose of cyclophosphamide that came into act. But in 2000, 
mycophenolate was used and 2001 uh, first time rituximab was used for SLE. But only in 2011, re really a drug got approved for lupus and that was belimumab. So this looks a li little uh, not very encouraging. It's a long journey and uh, we have hardly seen any new drugs coming up. But COVID has definitely given us new hope. With COVID, what we have seen is we have looked at so much of repurposing of existing drugs. So today my focus would be to understand the pathogenic targets and look at the existing drugs and the trials that have been see, looked into it. We'll be looking at drugs that, have be, that are being used for various uh, diseases, including cancers, and see how it falls into place and while we understand the pathogenesis of lupus. So understanding lupus, as Sir told, uh, it is now slowly tilting towards the innate immune arm with neutrophils playing a major role and with dendritic cells playing a major role. But still there are so many questions that are unanswered. And as of now, we are all like blind men looking at an elephant and you know we are trying to figure out what exactly is lupus. Some are proponents of innate immune system, some are proponents of the adaptive immune arm. So we really don't know for sure what it is, but we know most of these are true. As isolated, they are all true. So this is a uh, this is a diagram that is a simplistic diagram to explain what lupus is. You know, in a in a genetically susceptible individual who is asymptomatic, when he or she comes in contact with various uh, environmental or microbial stress they lose their tolerance towards self-antigens and starts de start developing autoantibodies. Once these autoantibodies are developed, there is something called an epitope spreading and the autoantibodies towards self-antigen keep spreading and then it precipitates a disease or a symptom. This is when the disease is classified or diagnosed. So here there are a number of factors that actually play uh, an important role, uh, namely the type one interferons, the tum tumor necrosis factors and several cytokines. So wh what we can do is we can study this phase from autoantibody generation to system onset and then try to block several pathogenic targets. This is one figure that we'll be coming across again and again throughout this presentation. So what we have to understand with this is there is an autoantigen, mainly a double-stranded DNA, maybe that is uh, put out by neutrophils due, during the netosis or due to uh, apop increased apoptosis or due to decreased clearance of cell debris. So this goes and stimulates the plasma site or dendritic cell, which increases a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines, including uh, type 1 interferons. This in turn will upregulate antigen presentation or self-antigen presentation by dendritic cells which will act with our T cells. And this T CD4 T cell will have communication with B cells to produce autoantibodies, which we know like uh, autoantibodies like anti-double-stranded DNA, which are also pathogenic in lupus. So first let us start concentrating on the B cells and plasma cells, that is the adaptive arm of the uh, lupus. So a, any B cell which starts off with common lymphoid progenitor cell will mature uh, will uh, go to uh, pass through various transition phases and become immature C, uh, immature t cells uh, immature cells in the periphery once they become immature cells they have two fates they could either enter the fol uh, follicle or they can be in the marginal zone so in the follicle once they get into the follicle they have increased um, classic uh, <clears throat> and uh, somatic hypermutation and they form a lot of plasma blasts and long and short lived plasma cells. These are the group of cells which are responsible for producing a lot of autoantibodies. So it's as simple as this. There's an activated B cells which becomes a plasma blast from where the autoantibodies keep uh, gets produced. So these are available in our circulation. So a lot of autoantibodies are generated which, uh, which we know which uh, uh, co complements the flare disease flare in lupus, like uh, anti-double-stranded -do DNA, for uh, they, for example. And then what happens to these plasma blasts is they enter a niche, like a bone marrow or an organ niche, where they form, become plasma cells. So these plasma cells become strict containment zones, and none of our drugs can go and enter there. While these are the plasma cells, which are the main culprits, which starts producing the pathogenic autoantibodies. So in lupus, there are a lot of problems with B cells. As such, the tumor necro uh, the TLR signaling is high in lupus. 
and there is increased somatic hypermutation and increased class switching in lupus b cells and there is increased cell responsiveness to various uh, self antigens and uh, non peptide antigens like uh, lipopolysaccharides and other environmental triggers all this will lead to ultimately lead to increased plasma cell survival besides this b cells also have a lot of downstream pathway uh, abnormalities that is the downstream signals that uh, that carry the signal from the b cell receptor and towards transcription ultimately resulting in inflammation and tissue damage or uh, loss of tolerance in b cells and production of auto antibodies so there are a lot of targets which are being tried but they are all in either preclinical or, or early clinical stages of treatment uh, of testing but one thing that we already know and has come out recently is the baf this baf is like a survival factor for b cells which will act on three of these receptors that are the baf receptor or bcma or tasi receptor so baf will go act on one of these receptors and will increase immature b cell survival or maturation or will increase the plasma cell survival or will increase t cell independent antibody response so all of this will ultimately lead to increased antigen uh, antigen presentation or increased auto antibody production which is again pathogenic so this is a good target and which has been tried and belimumab is one of the drugs which is already approved for this so we won't be discussing this but why we need to understand baf is we all know that there are several uh, ex uh, surface expression on b cells based on the stage of maturation of these b cells so if we see cd20 which is a favorite uh, surface marker we use rituximab to just block it but cd20 is present only from pre b cell to partial uh, half of plasma blast whenever plasma blast is transitioning into plasma cells they lose their cd20 expression so we are essentially killing all these cells from pre b cell to plasma cell plasma blast while by giving rituximab but we are letting out plasma cells so maybe this is one of the reason why rituximab is not always successful then we have cd19 which is a pan b cell marker and it should be uh, very difficult to target this without causing uh, very bad adverse effects and infections the way there is a very uh, there's a in there's an interesting target in the form of cd cd38 which is expressed on pre and pro b cells as well as in germinal center b cells and in plasma blast and plasma cells predominantly so once it becomes in plasma blast and plasma cells we know that it is we are directly targeting the um, auto antibody producing cells the main culprits so accordingly according to the various surface receptors that are expressed on b cells we have epratozumab which is not a big success in lupus then we have rituximab ocrelizumab and ofatumumab which are all being tried in lupus and we have enough uh, experience with rituximab in lupus and fairly satisfied with the response and even the ular guidelines state that you can use it in refractory cases of lupus especially lupus nephritis then the challenge actually starts in plasma cells where we don't have these cd20 receptors they only have some special tasi receptor or bcma and memory cell b cells where they have some tasi cd19 and baf receptors so these are the places which possibly can be uh, targeted so our focus today would be plasma cells because plasma blasts and plasma cells are very closely related and most of the targets are shared so in plasma cells we have two wonderful drugs which are being used by our oncology colleagues so these two wonderful drugs uh, target one of them target the proteus inhibitors we know that proteasome sorry the proteasome inhibitors the, what we know the proteasome is required for protein unfolding within the cell and then processing it and maybe for antigen presentation or other cellular activities so if something inhibits the proteasome it will cause cell death and it would be a focused cell death of plasma cells then there is cd38 whose role actually is not very well understood but what people have seen is if it is blocked the particular cell the plasma blast or the plasma cell will go into apoptosis and these two are widely used in multiple myeloma patients especially in or any other plasma cell dyscrasia so there is a trial of bortezomib it's not a trial it's a case series uh, of 12 patients with sle out of these 12 patients four of the patients had Uh, also had uh, multiple myeloma so it became easy for them to uh, uh, give bortezomib and rest of the eight did not have multiple myeloma 
so patients who had multiple myeloma received the normal regime which is a slightly a higher dose at 1 4 and 8 and 11 days of 1.3 mg of body surface area and other refractory lupus without multiple myeloma they gave a modified dose that is just 1 mg of bortezomib administered subcutaneously versus iv in multiple myeloma and a single iv dose of uh, dexamethasone so what they found is at introduction at induction when these when these patients had a sled i of 21 to begin with over 3 months the sled i drastically fell and over 6 to 12 months or uh, at least at 6 months what they saw is the proteinuria also fell significantly from 6 g to less than a gram so definitely then bortezomib seems to be working here but the main concern with bortezomib is side effects so when they looked at the side effects of course a hypogammaglobulinemia was observed in all the patients uh, which is the function of plasma cells so we know that biologically at least these drugs are working in lupus but so peripheral sensory neuropathy which is another major concern while treating multiple myeloma was only seen in two patients and these two patients were the patients who al already had multiple myeloma and they had received higher doses of bortezomib so the take away of this study is a lower dose of bortezomib may be used in lupus nephritis who are refractory and it works so pro uh, these proteasome targets uh, proteasome inhibitors could be a valid target for lupus and we can maybe probably start using in some of the difficult to treat lupus nephritis patients which we already have the next drug is a daratumumab which was recently published in new england journal of medicine here again it was a uh, it was a, just a series of two patients so these two patients one of them was a lupus nephritis who was refractory and the other one was a hemolytic anemia who was refractory so you can see this lupus nephritis patient already had received bortezomib but the urine protein creatinine ratio kept raising for the next 42 months so there that is when they start, decided to use the daratumumab so once they used daratumumab we look at the outcomes later similarly the patient 2 who had hemolytic anemia hb uh, hemoglobin was significantly falling they tried ivag did not work they tried rituximab did not work then they tried uh, bortezomib which did not work finally they gave daratumumab and they found that it uh, the uh, hemoglobin started improving so the strategy was to give four doses of daratumumab at 16 mg per kg body weight uh, per week for four weeks and then uh, they started of giving belimumab after four weeks this is to prevent repopulation of the left out uh, b cells and if there are left out b cells what happens is there is a reciprocatory increase in b uh, b list and this b list what it does is it will increase the proliferation of the uh, left out uh, b cells and make them into plasma blasts or plasma cells which will again become pathogenic so they didn't want this to happen so they blocked the b list the baf and then they they gave daratumumab and then just blocked off the baf so what happened is whatever was removed continued to be like that and uh, the immature b cells could not proliferate and become uh, plasma blasts or plasma cells so what they found so the sled i score significantly decreased and uh, in the patient one who was a lupus nephritis patient even in patient two the sled i score significantly decreased to almost remission ranges just four another interesting fact is the uh, prednisolone dose which was significantly decreased in these patients the uh, first patient needed up to 20 to 30 mg prednisolone per day which was which could be decreased at 1 year to 4 mg and even in the second dose uh, refractory autoimmune hemolytic anemia we could see a similar trend so these two are viable targets which are already available with us uh, which are being used by our uh, oncology colleagues and maybe could potentially be useful because we know that these are the auto antibodies which cause the patho pathology in these patients and these two manifestations that is the hemolytic anemia and lupus nephritis seems to be predominantly auto antibody mediated so these are the two indications possibly for these two drugs then moving on to t cells uh, what it is the same diagram in a different uh, light we saw the uh, antigen presenting cells like the dendritic cells which will present the self antigens to t cells 
the naive T cells in lupus, what happens is uh, there is a decreased tendency to produce IL-2, which causes decreased T, regulate, T, T regulatory cells. We know that T regulatory cells are good kind of cells in an autoimmune scenario. For, then we there is increased T follicular helper cell, which ca causes increased class switching of B cells uh, to anti antibody producing B cells. Then there is TH17 cells, which is a pathogenic T cell. Now, and then the CD8 T cells are converted into increased double negative T cells, which became pro, which becomes pro-inflammatory. So, like what we saw for B cells, unlike for B cells, the T cells do not have many surface markers which can be targeted. One is the CTLA4, which we are all uh, aware of. Uh, we used abatacept in mostly rheumatoid arthritis, but now it is not available in India. Uh, but the results of abatacept in lupus were not great. Another is the CD40, the CD40 ligand, which is a Mm. Uh, which which the, the this interaction is needed for the t cell b cell interaction and and antibody or b cell proliferation so the, if this is blocked people thought that you know the b cell might not proliferate and they tried dapirolizumab uh, unfortunately these uh, trials had higher incidence of uh, thrombosis so they had to stop the trial and uh, there is no progress in that uh, at least so what can we do? We have understood that the T cell surface may not be a very good place to actually, you know, block. So what we can block is what we can increase is the T Rex. We know that the T Rex are good cells and they are low in lupus. They are they're functionally uh, not very robust in lupus. So we can increase the T Rex. What do these T Rex do? The T Rex will decrease the dendritic cell or antigen presentation by dendritic cell. It will decrease maturation of T effector cell and also decrease B cell activation and uh, class switch and other things, uh, thus decreasing the uh, autoantibody production. So why not we just increase the T Rex? So to t increase the T Rex, we have we have novel two methods to do it. One is to give low dose of interleukin two, and the second one is to give uh, to target the uh, mTOR pathway. So what does the low dose IL-2 do? So once you give the low dose IL-2, it will increase the CD4 Treg and CD8 Treg population, which will decrease all the activation of effector T cells. So there was a trial that is the Transeric, uh, which was uh, recently produced, uh, which was recently published, where they gave uh, one million units of uh, uh, interleukin two subcutaneously. Uh, initially, they gave for five days and then they gave uh, every two weeks for six months. So what they found is, first of all, the biological effect. Our target was to increase the T-Rex. So from baseline, as compared to baseline, all the T-Rex started increasing till, till the time that it, uh, these uh, drugs were given. And when they looked at the SLED-I score, what happened is there was significant fall in SLED-I, at least up to the time the uh, IL-2 was given. This also allowed the investigators to decrease steroids. So this could be a steroid. Uh, it could be given to prevent higher doses of steroids in these patients, especially refractory patients. And then it could, uh, you know, since it is given once in two weeks and that to subcutaneous and that to in a very low dose, it could be safe. And this, this study did not find any uh, adverse effects. Uh, only a few adverse effects they found was the uh, injection site reaction or some flu-like symptoms. There was another study that where they gave a different regime of uh, aldosteronic, that is low dose interleukin two. Here the dose ranged from one million to three point five million units, and each cycle of four consecutive injections were given every day, followed by some break phase. So they gave four cycles of four consecutive injections each, like this, and they found the CD twenty five was increasing as whenever you gave a low dose IL two the Treg was increasing, Treg population would increase. So as compared to the baseline at day 62, uh, the Treg population was significantly higher in all these refractory lupus patients. And even the Selena sled I score significantly fell from about 10 to almost less than five or four uh, by 61 days. But a drawback you have to, we have to understand here, as soon as the interleukin two injection is stopped, the disease is likely to go back to an original pre-injection uh, state. The sled started increasing and the T-Rex started decreasing. So this could be a stopgap place, 
because by giving tRIG we are not increasing the chance of infection whereas by giving prednisolone we would have increased or other immunosuppressants we would have increased the chance of infection now you would ask me where is aldosteronecan used so aldosteronecan is also used in refractory multiple myeloma uh, uh, melanomas uh, and renal cell carcinomas especially in a higher dose so it fell out of uh, it was not it is not favored by oncologists now because there is a lot of cytokine storm that happens with high dose but with lower dose what these people observed is at especially at 1 million units there was hardly any adverse effect but the effect that is the desired effect was as good as what they had imagined so this could be a potential target especially steroid sparing approach steroid sparing approach in refractory diseases of lupus second thing what i told is to alter the metabolism of t cells so that we can increase the t reg cells for that we'll have to understand this complicated diagram uh, which i'm sure it's very easy for all of us but no it's not really easy so let us go to a simplified diagram where we see uh, in the presence of interferon there is decreased tryptophan utilization and increase in mtor pathway within cells so this is we all know that interferon type 1 interferon is very important and uh, is uh, increased in sle so these are the patients uh, because of increased interferon there is upregulation of mtor pathway and this increased in mtor pathway will result in decreased t regulatory cells increased th17 pathogenic cells and increased thrombosis in aps so what we can do is we can just block this mtor inhibitors we are all we are all aware of these drug eluting stents which has sirolimus in it Uh, so sirolimus is a very good option so people have tried giving sirolimus there what they have done is they have, for 27 patients with refractory sle they have given sirolimus in the range of 1 to 3 mg per day and this was a long trial uh, so what they found is the clinical slide i significantly dropped and physician global assessment also significantly dropped and what were the manifestations that actually worked or actually responded they are mainly arthritis and arthralgia it was predominantly musculoskeletal involvement that actually improved in these patients and the most important thing what i feel is we can taper off steroids and which was directly proportionate and you know there is a very good negative correlation among these patients uh, with the duration of treatment with mtor inhibitors and steroid taper so possibly sirolimus and other mtor inhibitors as of today could be used for uh, you know at least refractory musculoskeletal diseases in lupus instead of giving them steroids now we saw that it is the same diagram again you know this is the antigen presenting cell there is an antigen presenting cell there is a innate cell which is uh, releasing all the self antigens this antigen presenting cell that is the dendritic cell is uh, okay. taking up the self antigen and presenting it to see t cell and i need to or you need to increase the speed because the time is coming up yes it's over almost so we can basically block all these these things so there is interferon 1 interferon 6 17 12 23 20, tumor necrosis factor il1 and 18 but so many how can we target so in order to target this they, we have to understand this all these cytokines work through jack stat pathway mainly the jack1 and jack2 and jack3 and we all we are already aware of all the drugs like tofacitinib baricitinib which we are using in rheumatoid arthritis which are these blockers so in a trial of baricitinib about 314 patients were randomly assigned to various doses 4 and uh, 2 mg and what they found is a 4 mg dose uh, among these patient had a good clinical outcome uh, the sled i2 k score the sri4 response everything significantly improved with the 4 mg dose of baricitinib but the improvement again was in predominantly arthritis and rash with 4 mg od so as i said type 1 interferon in lupus is very important it decreases it decreases t reg cells it decreases nets and it increases baf and so how can we target the interferon pathway one is we can directly target interferon alpha by anifrolumab rotazolumab and cefalumab and interferon kinoid anifrolumab trials are out tulip 1 and 2 uh, which has some controversies but it might not come to india as of now then we can just target the tlrs because these uh, interferon is released because of tlr activation so that phase 1 trial is on and then there is the <clears throat> cd123 or bdca which can be blocked and which will decrease the interferon release by various inhibitors but these are not in the near future so to summarize what we can understand is you know b cell and plasma cell target seems to be working for auto antibody mediated manifestations predominantly like lupus nephritis and hematological and we can borrow from our oncology colleagues 
and T Rex can be good targets and have good safety profile, and we can increase T Rex by giving low dose IL two or mTOR inhibitor. And manifestations like skin joints seem to be driven by cytokines as of now. So JAK inhibitors may be an important target, important drug that could be used because it it has multiple uh, cytokine blocking properties. And finally, various combination of biologics is likely to be a norm because we have seen already daratumab being mixed with belimumab. We have just seen a, a trial of rituximab using with belimumab. So instead of using two together, maybe sequential use of biologics after understanding the pathophysiology is the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chengapa. It has been an exhaustive and a beautiful presentation. Thank um, you, sir. The uh, point is well taken. The concentration was more on the B cell because I think that is where uh, most of the work has been going on. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, the idea that I suggested uh, that perhaps we would be looking more at the uh, the innate immune system uh, could have actually thrown more light on yes. the interaction between these two. But unfortunately, you know, we do not have too many trials going on. Uh, targeting the innate immune system currently. Uh, but certainly there is scope for understanding and improving, um, understanding the futuristic targets, which you have outlined very beautifully. Uh, I can only take a couple of questions because the time is very short. Uh, one of the questions from Professor Ashok Kumar suggests that how risky uh, will be what is made to treat refractory thrombocytopenia and lupus because one of the adverse effects of what is not this thrombocytopenia. So the bortezomib, the main concern was infection as well as peripheral neuropathy. So what we have seen with the case series is if you use a probably lesser dose of bortezomib, then it could be a good uh, option, but there is no big trials to actually uh, support it. But uh, what we can get from this case series is a lower dose could be safe and we could try that. Can we try it with the thrombocytopenia? Does it cause thrombocytopenia? No, sir. Okay, oh, fine. Uh, one of the other questions, a lot of questions have been asked about uh, the role of different drugs, actually. One of them is the uh, role of newer glucocorticoids. Does it have any effect on the future targets? And the sir, other one is the role of avacopan. Yeah. Avacopan has shown a lot of promise in ankyloidosis as a steroid sparing agent. So that is because uh, the active, uh, the pr primary target there is the uh, complement receptor. So which uh, which is which may not be the case in lupus, but uh, we have to wait for trials. I think that tri some trials are on on it. Yeah, uh, there's another question from Dr. Prasad. What's the role of metformin? Yeah, metformin also is a good, uh, it could be a possible, uh, you know, uh, it, it changes the metabolomics of T cells and thus driving more of T reg generation, especially AMP kinase, it inhibits. So it could be a potential target, but uh, it could, you know, problem with most of the lupus trials is we look at solid endpoints, uh, which might not be achieved by any of the drugs, or we should probably not look at the classical sled eye or other things, or we could more concentrate on less uh, adverse in, uh, events or steroid sparing effect of these drugs. So then maybe uh, things like metformin and all can be considered. And especially if there is a comorbidity, it is a win-win situation with metformin. Thank you very much. Uh, because of paucity of time, I'll not be able to take all the questions. We can send some of these questions back to you for answering. Yes, Thank sir. you very much for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Sir. Now we move on to the next presentation, which is extremely important. Uh, it'll be presented by Dr. Anila Abraham Kuyen. Now, we know the renal involvement in lupus um, is pretty damaging. Um, around 60 to 70% of our cases come to us with some kind of nephritis. And the debate is whether to do a biopsy or not to do a biopsy, depending upon the circumstances in which the patient comes. So renal biopsy, we know, has a lot of important uh, information that can provide both uh, during the, for, for treatment as for prognosis. So we will take a journey with Dr. Anila regarding the usefulness of having a renal biopsy done, whether it should be done in all patients of lupus with nephritis, 
And what are the things that we need to look into, like keeping into a Pandora's box? Dr. Anila Abraham Kurian is the director of the Renopath Center for Renal and Neurological Pathology at Chennai. She has already had 58 publications in national and international journals. She has two book chapters and more than 50 invited lectures. So it's all yours now, Anila. You can start your presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope you can see the screen now. Yeah, yeah. Fine. Uh, at the onset, I would like to thank Dr. Alahindru and Dr. Sapan for giving me this opportunity. And I'm very well aware that I'm talking to rheumatologists and not pathologists. So I'm going to keep it as basic as possible. So now the first question is, um, why do you have to do a renal biopsy? And for that, we know that lupus nephritis involves all the compartments of the kidney. Now the kidney has four compartments, you know, the glomeruli, there's tubules, there's interstitium and the blood vessels. So all four in varying combinations can be affected by, because of the, the lupus nephritis. Now, what are the features that you have to look for? And this is what the ISN, the International Society of Nephrology, Renal Pathology Society, the classification that we follow, they look into certain features in the glomeruli and that is what makes them decide what class it is, whether it's an active or a chronic lesion and also helps in dis uh, distinguishing whether it is a class three or a class four. Because under the microscope, class three and class four are identical. The only difference is whether 50% or less are involved or more than 50% of the glomeruli are involved. So it's only the percentage of glomeruli that differentiates it. So these are certain points that are very important when we look at a biopsy. And another feature that is exceptionally important for you to remember is lupus, unlike many other primary renal diseases, lupus is very heterogeneous in the sense that I have put four glomeruli in this uh, screen. This one looks relatively normal. This one is showing segmental scarring. This one is showing segmental endocapillary proliferation in the sense that it has become solid and it's forming a crescent. And here's another one with a crescent, but no proliferation. So four glomeruli all in the same field, but if all four of them look completely different from each other. Now, this is something that is very unique of lupus nephritis. And another condition where you can see something like this is IgA nephropathy. But other than that, most of the other primary renal disease, what nephrologists deal with, all the glomeruli look alike. But the moment a pathologist sees something like this, think of lupus. Now, coming to the main topic. Now, what is the role of the kidney biopsy? One, as you all know, is to establish a diagnosis of lupus nephritis. Though you all clinically would have already made a diagnosis of lupus nephritis, a tissue diagnosis is almost always indicated. The second is classify lupus. Again, clinically, you would have classified it into a proliferative type or a nephrotic syndrome. If the patient has a lot of proteinuria, you would have called it a class five. But again, that's a clinical classification. The final diagnosis comes after the tissue has been subjected to biopsy and studies by light and immunofluorescence. And finally, and the most important I would say is to determine the extent of the acute and chronic injury. That is our activity and chronicity, because in the end, what is it that you want to know? You already have the diagnosis and you have the classification. Now you want to know how are you going to treat? The last talk, we heard a whole variety of uh, you know, drugs, which were like absolutely Greek and Latin to me, but then you would want to decide which one to use based on what we call as active or chronic. Now, the first point is to establish the diagnosis of lupus nephritis or other processes. I just want to stress here, it is not mandatory that a patient with lupus nephritis should, sorry, with SLE should have only lupus nephritis. There may be other conditions. Definitely lupus nephritis would be there 90% of the time. Sometimes it would just be lupus podocytopathy. You could just have thrombotic microangiopathy in a patient and I don't know about how it is in the rest of the country, but in, in Tamil Nadu, a lot of pa patients resort to native medicines and native medicines 
patients come up with a high incidence of acute interstitial nephritis and acute tubular injury. So the patient just may be having SLE without renal involvement, but suddenly the creatinine goes up and you may think that it is a kidney involvement. Actually, it isn't. It could be just because of the medicines, the native medicines, which we don't know what it contains because many of them have very high levels of uh, heavy metals and that can cause a lot of injury. So you have a spectrum of biopsy findings in a patient of lupus. Now, the second thing, the indication for lupus biopsy is to correctly classify. And for classification, you're all very familiar. We've been having a number of classifications from way back in 1974. And what we currently follow is the 2018 revised classification of the ISNRPS. I'm not going through the details because it's there in all the textbooks. Thankfully, from 2003 to 2018, they have made things very simple in the sense now all the subheadings of active, chronic, mixed active and chronic, S is for segmental, global, all that nitty gritty things have all been taken away with and we have just six classes like how it was in the earlier ones. The minimal mesangial and mesangial proliferator where there is no endocapillary proliferation, it is only in the mesangial. The class three and four are together called as proliferative glomerulonephritis. The only difference between the two being the number of glomeruli that are involved. Membranous presence as nephrotic syndrome with a lot of proteinuria. And you have the advanced sclerosing type, which is like the tissue is damaged beyond repair and it's more than 90% of the glomeruli are gone. Now, the other changes for the exam going PG is probably that would be interesting is what, this, what else has this new system come up with? Earlier, we used to call it as an endocapillary proliferation. Now, they recommend that we do not use the term proliferation because we really don't know whether it is just endocapillary cells that are proliferating or it is just macrophages or neutrophils or any of the inflammatory cells coming there and making the glomerulus look hypercellular. So the preferred terminology is now endocapillary hypercellularity. And I, as I said earlier, the segmental and global uh, subheadings have been done away with. And now instead of A and C, we are supposed to give an activity index and a chronicity index. Now, after having said this, the accuracy depends on the clinician. It depends on how many glomeruli you have sampled. Now, if you give two or three glomeruli, it's almost impossible to apply this classification. And the recommendation is a minimum 10. Some studies have found that for actually for this classification to be of prognostic importance, you should give at least 20 glomeruli. But the underlying thing is the more the number of glomeruli, more accurate your classification is going to be. And for the pathologist, we have to uh, study multiple levels, especially to find out if there's a focal or a segmental lesion. Now, this is an easy slide. Basically, how we classify it is you look for glomerular immune deposits. That's how the IS and RPS classification is based on. It is the presence and the location of immune deposits. Now you have glomerular deposits. Where is it located? Is it in the mesangium? That's the first question. Okay, now you find out, yes, it is in the mesangium. Then the next question you ask is, sorry, is there hypercellularity? Now, if there is mesangial hypercellularity, it becomes class two. If there is no mesangial hypercellularity, it's class one. Now, assuming the immune deposits were in the subendothelial region, the next question is how many glomeruli are involved? Is it less than 50%? Then it's class three. If it's more than 50%, it becomes class four. Now, if the deposits are in the subepithelial region, it's straight away, it is membranous. So the importance is in where are the immune complexes located? Is it mesangial alone? Because if it is a subendothelial, you always will have some amount of mesangium. But when you have only mesangium without subendothelial or subepithelial, it becomes class one or class two. Now, this is what minimal, as the name suggests, is like all normal on light microscopy. It will look like the minimal change disease that is so common in um, among the patients with uh, kidney disease. Um, glomerular look absolutely normal on light microscopy, but IF will pick up some amount of immune deposits. And if you look carefully, all this is only in the mesangia. It is not highlighting the capillary loops. It's restricted to the mesangia. So it's a class one. 
a class two would be as the name suggests mesangial proliferation so the proliferation is taking place only in the mesangium that means the capillary loops are still open there is nothing happening within the capillary loops it uh, it is only in the mesangium so mesangial proliferation and the if would again show the deposits only in the mesangial region now focal and diffuse we will uh, discuss it together because it's only the percentage here there is proliferation of endothelial cells and there is neutrophilic infiltration even macrophages come and the diagnostic criteria is it will narrow or occlude the capillary lumen so like in the previous you will not see the empty spaces within the capillaries and it could be focal meaning only a small number of glomeruli or it could be diffuse meaning more than 50% or it could be segmental segmental means a portion of one glomerulus involved or global means the entire glomerulus uh, glomerulus is involved so these four terminologies we keep using back and forth so i'm sure the you are aware of the definition for each of these now this is a proliferating thing you see the number of cells are so much you can see neutrophils within the lumen the lumen is not empty it's filled you don't see empty spaces like a delicate uh, lace it's more like a solid glomerulus here and this is a global endocapillary proliferation whereas in this one only a small segment is showing proliferation so this is a segmental endocapillary proliferation and here again you have a normal glomerulus here and a glomerulus showing segmental proliferation immunofluorescence shows here immune deposits not just in the mesangium you can see the outlines of the capillary loop that's a feature of a proliferative glomerulonephritis and finally the membranous pattern there will not be proliferation instead the classical spikes are will be seen on the glomerular basement membrane this is a silver stain and this really picks up the spikes and the if will also resemble those spikes the subepithelial deposits and advanced sclerosing is when all the glomeruli are gone more than 90% and you don't have any viable glomeruli now the next most important thing is you need to determine the extent of acute or chronic kidney injury that is the activity index and the chronicity index again it's there in all the textbooks in all the journals i'm not going into the details these are the six activity markers that we look for we grade them as mild moderate severe less than 25 25 to 50% or more than 50% and then if we multiply it according to this formula and with a denominator of 24 the chronicity index is a denominator of 12 now one of the active indicators is this wire loop lesions and what are wire loop lesions they are basically immune complex deposits that are there in the subendothelial region and if they break off and come into the lumen you see them as hyaline thrombi so this is a classical example of a wire loop lesion and hyaline thrombi at the center the uh, the meson trichrome stain that we use is a stain that will actually stain the immune complexes so whatever you see in red here are all the immune complexes you can see them in the mesangium you can see it along the capillary loops you can see it in the lumen and this is the case of a proliferative type of a lupus nephritis fibrinoid necrosis is a feature and here you can see this pink amorphous material this is fibrin and fibrin is known to Uh, the, the moment you have fibrinoid necrosis you know it's a very active lesion that is why they recommend that you multiply it into two to call it as a uh, when you um, calculate the activity index and cellular crescents so these are crescents crescents are proliferation of cells outside the glomerulus but within the bowman's capsule so you have a lot of crescents here you look at the percentage and then you multiply it into two this is particularly important when you are comparing that you have a previous um, biopsy and you want to know whether the patient is still active or it, it has gone to the chronic stage now what are the immunofluorescence the moment you say immunofluorescence in lupus everybody would know that it's full house now for this full house you have all the three immunoglobulins gma complement c3 c1q and kappa and lambda light chains and that's when all the anti sera that we use are positive you need to remember that no it is not required or mandatory for to have a full house pattern to call it as lupus uh, many a times we don't have a full house igg is almost always there c3 is usually there 
C12 is common. MNA could be plus minus. And also remember, this positivity is not just restricted to the glomerulus. You can have these immune complexes and complements being deposited anywhere in the kidney, in the glomerulus, on the tubular basement membrane, on the blood vessels, and in the interstitium. Now, this is a typical full house positivity of GMA, C3C1Q, Kampa, Lambda, all intensely positive. Or this is one case where it is there in the glomerulus, it is slightly there over the Bowman's capsule, the tubular basement membranes. The moment we see a biopsy like this, we know that this patient has lupus or an autoimmune disease. Sometimes the clinical history is not there or the clinician hasn't suspected. Or sometimes we see from the, the government institutes if the patient is poor, they wouldn't have actually done an ANA. They would have just done a biopsy first and depending on the biopsy, they would work the patient up for lupus. So the moment we see a picture like this with a lot of immune complexes in the periphery, we know that this is a patient of lupus. And another interesting thing that we sometimes see, not always, is tissue ANA. That is, the nuclei take up this IgG staining, and it's thought that because when we freeze it, there is some damage to the nuclear membrane, and the IgG in the plasma seeps in, and when you put uh, IgG antisera, it stains positive. Now, that was about the glomerular lesions. Now, what about the other compartment, the tubules and the interstitium? There could be inflammation. If you have inflammation, it's a marker of activity. Fibrosis, atrophy, a marker of chronicity. And immune deposits help you make the diagnosis. Now, there's something that's completely ignored. And I always wonder why each time that there's a revision, uh, I always wonder why they, ha they haven't included the vascular lesions in lupus. Because we know the moment there is a vasculitis, it's a, it portends a very, very poor prognosis. But however, in the classification, they have not included vascular lesions. Now, what are the vascular lesions that you can see in lupus? You can see a variety. It could be completely normal. IF is also normal. Or you can have, it looks normal, but IF may have some deposits. It could be lupus vasculopathy, where even on light microscopy, you can see just like wire loops, you have a lot of immune deposits um, deposited along the capillary, uh, along, not the capillaries, outside the glomerulus, in the interstitium, the uh, interlobar or interlobular artery, even the um, arcuate arteries, you may see immune deposits there. Sometimes the the one that is that that doesn't have a good prognosis is you may have a necrotizing vasculitis, just like what you see in anchor vasculitis. You may have a transmural fibrinoid necrosis, thrombotic microangiopathy under a lot of settings, or sometimes it could just be hypertensive changes. So there are a variety of vascular changes that we see in a patient of lupus, and some are very important therapeutically as well as prognostically. So this is just a picture of lupus vasculopathy. It's a blood vessel with a lot of immune deposits around it. And when you do an eye of staining, it's positive. But this is no vasculitis. There is no inflammation here. So when there is no inflammation, we call it a vasculopathy. And when there's inflammation, we call it as a vasculitis. Now, this is vasculitis because as you can see, there's a lot of inflammatory cells going around here into the uh, wall of the vessels. There's the pink material here that you see is all fibrin. So there's a transmural fibrinoid necrosis with a lot of inflammation. And this is typical lupus vasculitis. And how do you confirm it? You can do a meson trichrome stain, which will stain fibrin as red. So you're absolutely sure that it is fibrin. Now, thrombotic microangiopathy in a renal biopsy, that is very important in a patient with lupus. You need to remember that it could occur in a variety of clinical settings, though, as we all know, it is most commonly associated with the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Very often, we see it as an overlap with systemic sclerosis also, or the patient could just be having, just like a common person without SLE, it could be part of an HUS or a TTP complex. So TMA on a biopsy, we can only call it as a TMA. You, it is for the clinician to find out whether it's you know, uh, part of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome or whether it's due to something else. Because all TMAs look identical under the microscope. But you need to remember that it could be because of a variety of reasons. And this is what TMA looks like. The pink material that you see occluding the efferent arteriole is fibrin. And you confirm it, you do a Meson trichrome, fibrin stains red. 
Very important to remember, TMA can coexist at any class. It's not just with the proliferative GN, it could be TMA with membranes also. And sometimes the only biopsy finding could be TMA. You may not have a proliferator, you may not have an other lupus nephritis. It could be just TMA in a patient with SLE. So there's a lot of uh, variation in the clinical picture in, uh, of uh, TMA in a patient with lupus. Now coming to lupus podocytopathy. Now, this patient is a known patient of SLE and the patient presents with nephrotic syndrome. So your clinical thing is, okay, he's got lupus nephritis, most probably it's class five membranous. But when you do the biopsy, the patient does not have, sorry, membranous. All he has is light microscopy. It could be minimal change disease, some amount, or it could be focused segmental glomerular sclerosis or a collapsing GM with very important or almost absent or very, very faint IF deposits. EM, electron microscopy will show diffuse food process effacement. And when you see this spectrum of picture, this is lupus photocytopathy. And why is it important to identify lupus photocytopathy? They are very responsive to steroid therapy. So it is, the clinician should be aware that all membranous, all nephrotic syndrome in a SLE patient need not be a class five. It could be a lupus photocytopathy. And the pathologist also should get an EM done to uh, demonstrate diffuse food process effacement to make this diagnosis. Now coming to anchor superimposed on lupus, sometimes we do see that. It can occur uh, superimposed on any class of lupus and the patient's presentation is usually like you may mistake it for a lupus flare with uh, renal insufficiency, proteinuria and hematuria. But what do you see on light microscopy? There is a lot of necrosis and crescent formation in the absence of a significant endocapillary proliferation. So whenever you see uh, crescentic, more than 50% of the glomeruli with crescents, it is wise to get a serum anchor done. Because for us, a crescent is a crescent. You will not be able to differentiate whether the crescent is because of a, a lupus or is it because of anchor. So the serology is the one that is going to help you establish the diagnosis. So that's something important, the press, importance of crescents in a patient with lupus. And what is the role of a repeat kidney biopsy that the, you will be in a better position to tell me that but from our practice what we see most of the cases of uh, re repeat biopsy comes when there is a flare sometimes when the, the patient is resistant to treatment and they want to reconfirm that whether the diagnosis is right very very rarely I would say probably one or two samples a year is what we see as protocol repeat biopsies now, finally, before I end, there's something new that's absolutely new and hot topic in uh, lupus nephritis and in uh, nephropathology per se is uh, things in membranous uh, lupus nephritis. Now, membranous nephropathy, membranous nephropathy is a condition, it's a primary uh, renal disease where now we know it was first discovered in 2009 that it is PLA2 or phospholipase A2 receptor. Antibodies are formed against this receptor, which is on the podos side and that is the one that's what was called as idiopathic membranous nephropathy now is called primary because of PLA2R. Now, after that there's been in the last one year there's been a lot of discovery especially after mass spectrometry regarding what are the possible antigens or antibodies against the proteins that causes lupus nephritis and for membranous lupus nephritis, they have recently come up with very two specific um, markers. One is the exostosin 1 and exostosin 2. Here you see that it's quite specific for lupus or any other autoimmune disease. Very recently, this is in the 2020 KI. And most recently, in fact, this the article has not been published. It's just published online two weeks ago about a, another marker. That is the NCAM1 neural cell addition molecule marker, which is again very specifically seen in patients with SLE and in patients with lupus, um, class five uh, lupus nephritis. And the good thing about this is they can also measure this in the serum. And it's uh, it they are predicting that it could be a good marker to monitor the disease uh, prognosis, I mean, how it responds to therapy and um, uh, decide on the further therapy by just looking at the serum markers. 
So what is the importance of these serum markers? Now, sometimes you all know that membranous nephropathy can be the first presentation of SLE without other clinical or serological sequelae. And it is only later that all the uh, serological markers turn positive. Membranous nephropathy could be the first, first presentation. So now, if we do this exhaustos in one, two, or N cam on the tissue, we will be able to tell you that, yes, this patient most likely has an autoimmune disease, and that is the one that's causing the membranous nephropathy. Because in our practice for nephrologists, any case of membranous nephropathy, we do a PLA to our a report of membranous nephropathy in 2020 is not complete if we don't do a PLA to our. I'm sure in the coming years, uh, a membranous uh, lupus nephritis will require these markers to confirm uh, the diagnosis. And probably you can do away with doing a biopsy because these markers are identified in the serum. And if you find them positive in the serum, you know that they're most likely because of a class five lupus nephritis. And you can just start treating and you can monitor the response because the serological response is much earlier than the clinical response. And that will help you um, titrate your doses and plan um, the treatment accordingly. Thank you. It's been an excellent uh, presentation, and uh, what a few things that we learned today about, uh, especially membranous nephropathy. Yes. Uh, I was just thinking. I mean, you see a lot of patients who have a combination of stage two, three, three, four. You know, is not uniformly you get stage three or four. Uh, I have seen a lot of patients having mixed varieties of histopathological yes. disease, and whether that uh, causes anything to do with the prognosis of the patient or it causes uh, the difficulty in prognostication and treatment. But anyway, uh, I must ask you a couple of very interesting questions that have come up uh, for you to answer. Uh, Dr. Aman has an interesting question. He says, uh, comment on collapsing glomerulopathy in SLE, number one, and can some histopath changes help in differentiating APS nephropathy in SLE uh, patient from TMA commonly seen in SLE? The first part, I understood the first part. You, when you see a collapsing glomerulopathy in a patient with SLE and you don't have much of an immune uh, response, that is the IF is not very strongly positive, you should think of a podocytopathy. Collapsing glomerulopathy is a podocytopathy. So this could be a lupus podocytopathy and not a lupus nephritis. The second question, I was not clear. Uh, whether uh, some histopath chains can differentiate APS nephropathy in SLE patient from TMA commonly seen in SLE? No, for us under the microscope, TMA is TMA. You see fibrin within capillaries, within uh, arterioles. It, it is not possible for us. Uh, we, you, if you tell us that the patient has APLA, then we know, okay, yes, it could be because of that. But without a clinical correlation, it is not possible. Uh, Dr. Amita has a question. What is the specificity of EXT1 and other markers? How often do you see them in proliferative lupus nephritis and those with mixed lesions? Okay, this is something which has come out in October 2020. So as you know, I have zero experience in it. It is only few centers, basically the Mayo Clinic that is coming up with it. Probably two years or three years from now, we'll be in a position to say how it is. But as of now, these are just very hot topics that you know, have captured the attention of the world because it's something absolutely new. Nobody in India is doing it as yet. Uh, two more questions, I suppose, because they look interesting to me. Ranjan Gupta says, how accurate is renal histopathology reporting in lupus nephritis without immunofluorescence in differentiating different classes? Without immunofluorescence? Yep. Yes. Okay. One is accuracy, as I said, depends on the number of glomeruli. The more number of glomeruli you give, it be, will be in a better position to call the differentiate class three, four, and five, or a combination of that. So that is one. So the number of glomeruli is very important. Immunofluorescence is important, especially if it is a fresh case of lupus. Like you don't know, you have not, the patient may be having SLE, but a diagnosis is not being made. In that case, immunofluorescence plays a very important role, especially to identify where it is located. But if it is a repeat biopsy or a biopsy during a flare and it's a proliferative um, lupus, we wouldn't really be worried about the immunofluorescence findings. Uh, 
because it's already an established uh, diagnosed case of lupus. In fact, there are conditions where the entire IF could be negative. The patient has been treated for quite a long time. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question, I suppose I cannot go further. There are lots and lots of questions. I think you have really uh, made people aware of many things. Oh, thank Vinash you. says uh, that if you do a staining with kappa lambda staining, lupus, uh, you find if kappa is more than lambda or lambda is more than kappa, does it change the interpretation and prognosis? No, if, if it is, we are not interested in whether it's more or less. It is whether it is absent or present. Like whether there's restriction in the sense either kappa or lambda is completely negative. When you see that, then the diagnosis is most likely not lupus nephritis. It is something called the PGN-MID, proliferative glomerulonephritis with monoclonal light chain deposits. In that case, you have to work up whether the patient has a plasma cell dyscrasia. So an underlying plasma cell dyscrasia may not be an overt myeloma, could be some dyscrasia that is causing the proliferation of a monoclonal type of a light chain. But Plus one, plus two, a mild variation is not significant. It is whether one is absent and one is present, which makes a, a big impact. And you have to look for, uh, you have to definitely do a complete workup for a myeloma or myeloma related disease. Thank you. Thank you, Anila. The rest of the questions I can send it by email. You can send it by email. You can answer them specifically. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you once again for inviting me for this. I hand over the mic to Dr. Renu to take over from here. Good evening, everybody. Now, first of all, I thank Dr. Alkendu Ghosh, Dr. Sapan, and Dr. Shanoi for giving me this opportunity and uh, uh, for organizing these webinars. So in this pandemic, we are uh, updating our knowledge sitting in our homes. So now we proceed on to the third lecture of this evening by Dr. Prasar Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh is Professor, Department of Rheumatology, Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education Research, Kolkata. He is a DM in Immunology from SGPGI Lucknow, and he has 38 publications in various national and international journals to his credit. He is also involved in various research projects uh, which are re related to the lupus. And he will be talking about a very important clinical situation, a real dilemma for any rheumatologist, how to differentiate lupus flare from infection. As we all know, infections are so common in uh, lupus patients. And uh, these account for uh, about 25 to 50% of overall mortality in lupus. And infection may be mistaken for flare and treatment with steroids or uh, uh, immunosuppressive drugs may be detrimental. Now, over to Dr. Ghosh to enlighten uh, the audience about this important topic. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your kind uh, introduction. And thanks to Dr. Alakinda Ghosh and Dr. Shapon for giving me this opportunity to speak on this topic. So my topic is uh, infection or disease flare in lupus. And uh, if anybody has treated a patient of lupus, he knows that uh, it's always, always a deal dilemma. When a patient of lupus presents with fever, all the time there's a problem differentiating whether it is infection or it is flare. And on the top of that, patients might have infection as well as flare. So patients who have got flare, they have more chance of infection. So things becomes even more complicated. And I shall start with a patient, uh, which, I, uh, which, uh, which she presented, she was a 34 year lady, she presented 20 years back with fever, polyarthritis, raw ulcer, skin rash, photosensitivity, uh, positive ANA, uh, DHDNA, and she was diagnosed as lupus and was treated with hydroxychloroquine and steroid, probably because of uh, arthritis or maybe she was given loads of, loads of steroids. In 2005, she developed cervical tuberculosis, lymph node tuberculosis, and was treated with anti-tubercular drugs for, uh, for six months, and she was cured. In May 2008, she had bilateral feet swelling, and the 24-hour urinary protein was 2.6 gram per day. She also was detected to be hypertensive, diabetic, and kidney biopsy showed class 5 nephritis. She was treated with iathioprine and, and steroid, 1 milligram per kg steroid, and the problem started then. In, in 2009, June, she had fever, headache. However, she did not have any injury, but the meningitis was suspected. MRI was normal. CSF showed lymphocytic pleocytosis. Protein was a little bit elevated, and she was diagnosed to have tubercular meningitis provisionally and was started on ATT, 
had temporary improvement with relapse of symptoms. Basically, she had cryptococcal meningitis, and then she was treated with amputation B. She was improving, but in September 2009, she developed UTI and due to E. coli, it required admission for that, it required IV antibiotics. In October, she had pneumonia and she died. So this is not very unusual for a patient of lupus who develops one infection after another. And uh, those especially uh, uh, lupus with nephritis were on high dose of steroids and other immunosuppressions. And the, if you look at the mortality in lupus, uh, we all know that it's a mortality is bimodal and early within the five years and one is late, say after five years. So within the five years, the mortality is mainly because of infection, also because of active disease. And late mortality is mainly cardiovascular and may also be because of infection. And uh, if you look at the incidence of infection, uh, there are about 50 to 500, 150 infections in 100 patient years. That means uh, almost every patient gets infected. And this is a study including all patients, minor organ lupus, uh, the other active lupus like uh, lupus nephritis, major lupus like lupus nephritis. And in spite of all this, the survival of lupus at 10 years is more than 90%, according to Western literature. So infection is very common in lupus and almost all patients of lupus will have infections. Now, if you look at the cause of infection, the cause of infection is just like in our community, what about the common cause of infection in our community is also common cause of infection in lupus patients. Like bacterial infection is common, like the skin infection, respiratory tract, urinary tract infections, which are common in the local, in the community also, common, common in the SLE patients also. Microbacterium, like tuberculosis, virus, like herpes, zoster, fungus, all, are, all infections are, are quite common. And if we look at the organisms which are isolated, we find again the common organisms, which you find in the other patients. So E. coli, staph, streptococcus, pneumonia, salmonella, pseudomonas, candida, uh, microbacterium, tuberculosis, again, common infection in the community, also common infections in patients with lupus. The site of infection, if we look at again, the common sites of infection also, the common sites like chest infections, the only tract infections, uh, bacteremia, sometimes even without the source of infection, tuberculosis, cellulitis, pyelonephritis, meningitis, etc. And coming to microbacterial infection, this is very important for, for our community because our patients are on high dose steroids in our country. Because on high dose steroids are also on other immunosuppressants like that. We use most of the time cyclophosphamide, which answer tuberculosis, especially disseminated tuberculosis, very much in patients with lupus. And in one study, it was found that it is TB is in about even percent of the patients of lupus. They suffer from tuberculosis. And also, there can be infection by rarely by non tuberculosis microbacteria. We had one patient who of non tuberculosis microbacteria infection, and he presented as a just like a patient of dermatomyositis. He had skin rash and also had myalgia, muscle weakness. Basically, the patient developed abscess later on. And so, sometimes the infection can mimic lupus flare or uh, dermatomyositis flare, and then patient can also have leprosy. Viral infections are also quite common. The literature says most common infection is over virus. We do not look for it, but what you commonly see is that infection by herpes zoster. The reactivation, herpes zoster reactivation is very common, and also we see the papilloma virus, viral wars. Fungal infection, candida is almost all patients of lupus have got fungal infection. The candida infection is so common, also, uh, also of tinea. And sometimes they also get cryptococcal infection, just like our patients in index patients. Now, why? Patients of lupus are more prone to infection because the, one of the one of the major major factors is they are on immunosuppression, like cyclophosphamide, like corticosteroids. They prone they make the patient prone to infection, but also the lupus patient they have an inherent problem in both their innate as well as the adaptive immune system. In the innate immune system, they have got low complements. The this polymorphism in the marriage binding lectin, then decreased expression of the complement receptors on lymphocytes, RBCs, neutrophils, and also a different autoantibodies like anti rho can cause problem in the phagocytosis, and also there are problems in the adaptive immune arm, arms also. Because of all these patients on lupus, they are prone to infections. And if you look at the predictors of infection, different studies have shown that patients with active disease, with cytopenia like leukopenia, lymphopenia, especially lymphopenia, then low complements, renal damage, lung damage, immunosuppressive therapy, CNS disease, basically patients with very active disease and organ damage, they are more prone to infection. And in this study, in which was published in Arthritis Research and Therapy in 2009, they found that lung involvement had a odds ratio of 3.1, even higher than that of penicillin, which, is, which was 
Now, what does that mean? Means that patients with lung involvement have got 3.1 times more chance of infection as compared to patients without lung involvement. So, patients with SLE with ILD, interstitial lung disease, they have more chance of infection. Obviously, pneumonia. And penicillin dose milligram per day, it's 1.1. Means each milligram increase in penicillin, or each, if we share that 10 milligram dose increase in penicillin, there will be 11 times chance of or uh, chance of uh, infection. It's like that. On the other hand, use of antimalarial had an odds ratio less than 1, 0 0.07. Means if we use antimalarial, like hydroxychloroquine, which you use in almost all patients, the chances of infection will be less. So it, dec it decreases the chance of infection. And it's a recent study, a meta analysis, which was published this year only. And in this, they have, they, they have taken about 532 studies, included after, after removing the duplicates. And then, after, then they came down to 39 studies, which, which, which was included for the meta analysis. And they found that infected SLE patients had a significant higher incidence rates of lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia, like cytopenia, like all this, what you have already have spoken about the active disease, uh, the diabetes mellitus. Uh, elevated keratin, renal damage, use of steroids, higher, higher mean dose of penicillin, um, mm. and antimalarial use was, was associated with lower, lower chance of infection. So basically, it's, it's, the meta-analysis uh, almost adds nothing to it, uh, nothing new. It, it, uh, it confirms the, uh, other, the older findings. And in the meta-analysis, they say for steroid, they, 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 they looked at about, the, about 30 studies. And, uh, and this is in this plot. Basically, this solid line, this is the one. It's the odds ratio of one, means it's a neutral one. And something on the right side means higher risk. And so steroid having patients who are infected, they are more likely to have higher dose of, uh, to be on steroids. So in infected recently patients, they, have, they, they are more likely to be on corticosteroids. And also the infected recently patients are more likely to be on cyclophosphamide. On the other hand, they found that methotrexate was neutral. They did not find much difference. And antimalarial was considered uh, with less of infection. And they also looked at other things like mycophenolate, tacrolimus, those azathioprine they found did not find much difference. But we know that patients who are on azathioprine or mycophenolate or tacrolimus, they are having more chance of infection, especially when they are, they will be on steroids also. So patients who will be getting steroids, uh, uh, mycophenolate also will be getting particular steroids also. So even this, even if this metallicity does not say anything about, uh, uh, they, they said, he said that mycophenolate or tacrolimus or azathioprine may not be that uh, may, that infection causing, but we know that it, it will cause because they are all the time associated with, uh, they're given along with steroids. Now, when a patient presents to the clinician, how does it differ? How, how does he uh, uh, differentiate this fever, whether it is because of infection or because of basically flare or, or because of both? Now, we look at this, this parameter. All the time we looked at these parameters, they are really, really available also. So fever, high grade fever, if somebody having fever, say 103, 104, or moderate grade fever, the chances of infection is more. Obviously, it is not absolute. Patient, patient obviously can have very high grade fever because of disease activity. But if the, if the degree of fever is more, probably the infect, chance of infection becomes more. There is CRP. In active SLE, we do not expect high, high CRP. We expect that in active SLE, CRP should be on the lower side or, or, or normal because CRP is one of the molecule which is consumed during the removal of the antigen antibody complexes. So in SLE, there is a lot, there are a lot of antigen antibody complex formation, and CRP is involved in the removing of these complexes by the reticular endothelial cells. Also, the patients of SLE, they have got uh, their CRP, say, might have CRP gene polymorphism. So their level of CRP might be less then. And because of low CRP level, they are predisposed to probably SLE. So it can be, uh, it can be, it can be effect, low CRP can be effect as well as can be the cause, cause of the problem, disease. So anyway, the CRP level is usually normal in, in, in active SLE patients, but it is raised in patients, of inf in patients with infection with SLE. Procalcitonin, especially in, in patients with bacterial, uh, bacterial infection, level of procalcitonin becomes high, high WBC count. So normally in SLE patients, we expect that the WBC count would be low and there will be, there will be lymphopenia, but if there is high leukocyte count, uh, we should think of infection. Then complements level, high complement levels. Normally in active SLE, the complements are low because complements are produced in the liver and they are consumed in the immune complexes. So immune complex formation requires antigen antibody plus complements. So the complements in active lupus is expected to be low. 
but if it is high, it goes more in favor of infection. So these are the parameters by which the clinicians at the bedside they usually differentiate, try to differentiate between uh, infection versus uh, uh, versus flare. And this is a study which looked at these parameters, and this is called Arushi curve, receptor operative characteristic curve analysis. And the area under the curve for the procalcitonin is the highest. That means that procalcitonin has the highest capability of differentiating infection from the flare, followed by CRP, followed by WBC count. So they looked at these three parameters and they came out to uh, they came out with this uh, with these findings. But as you, as, you, as, you, as you see that uh, there are a lot of uh, variations in the studies, but but any clinician when they face with a patient of infection with, with fever with SLE, uh, in SLE patient, they usually go through these parameters to differentiate between infection and flare. And these are the tests which I, which I do. I look at this, uh, the complete blood counts and look for lymphocytopenia. Because lymphocytopenia is almost universal in, in patients with lupus. Any active lupus, uh, severe lupus will have lymphocytopenia. Then anti DHDNA titer, anti DHDNA antibody titer, complement level, urine sediment, the Fledite score, look at the disease activity, ESR, CRP. So there is something called ESR CRP ratio also. And also, lastly, also look at ferritin. Because nowadays we are doing ferritin regularly and we are, uh, we are picking up many patients of uh, macro activation syndrome. Unless we do ferritin, it becomes difficult to uh, diagnose it because the macro activation syndrome can have similar findings. Pancytopenia, the patient can have uh, fever and all those things. Transaminides can, all can happen in, in active lupus. So coming to them individually, CRP uh, is an acute phase reactant which is synthesized in the liver in response to cytokine like IL-6. And it has a very fast kind of disease. So within uh, 12 to 24 hours of infection, it gets elevated. And if the CRP level is uh, more than six, as I have said that you know, SLA which should have normal CRP, or, or on, the, on the lower CRP should be on the lower side. But if CRP is more than six, usually it, it is associated with, uh, with infection, especially bacterial infection. And there is something, a ratio called the ESL CRP ratio. If it is more than or equal to 15, it's suggested of activity. If it is below 10, it's suggested of infection. Now, it's a recent study. They have looked at something called ESRP. They have called it ESR parameter, and they have given the formula for calculating in men and women. For men, it is ESR divided by age by two, and female in ESR divided by age plus 10 divided by two. And what they have found is that, the finding is that in patient with flare and infection, and patient with both flare and infection, so in patients who have got both flare and infection, the level is high. And then they did a, Arushi curve analysis, basically this analysis is done all the time to differentiate and how good is the test. So if you use ESRCRP to differentiate between infection versus flare, how good will be the test? And they found that if the ESRCRP, uh, the, the, the parameter is more than 1.1, the, this is the curve. And the sensitivity is 68%, specificity is 63%. That means that it, from this study, it, it doesn't seem to be that good. I think we have got better marker than ESRP to look for uh, to differentiate between infection and flare. So it may not be uh, that I don't think it's much encouraging. CRP level. CRP level in SLE with flare, it is low. And in SLE with uh, uh, this infection, it is very high. And this, these are called the box and whisker plots. These are called, and this is the median. This line is the median. And this box means 25th to 25th, 75th percentile. So, and the lower limit is this, upper limit is this, this whiskers. And similarly, in ESR level also, in flare it increases, but infection it increases even more. So, both ESR, both ESR as well as CRP rises in infection, but ESR also rises in flare also, because there is inflammation. Anti-C1Q, it's a, uh, it's the first component, C1Q is the first component of the classical pathway of complement activation, and it basically is involved in the removing the uh, antigen antibody complex. So, antigen antibody com complex along with complement with the formation of complex, and then it gets uh, uh, removed by the reticular endothelial system. And it was discovered in 1984, and it has been suggested that patient, especially in patients with lupus nephritis, the level is very high. So, in this study, they found that in, uh, in, a, in a lupus act, which is not active and active lupus nephritis, basically, the level is very high in lupus nephritis patients. So, anti C1Q antibody. In patients with lupus nephritis, the level is, is distinctly high, very high level. 
Pro calci to it's a marker of sepsis, you know, specially bacterial infection, and raised level more than 0.5 microgram per liter is HTO of uh, uh, bacterial infection. Uh, conflicting studies are there, but overall, uh, it's a good marker uh, to diagnose uh, bacterial sepsis in a patient to patient to lupus. And the level is virtually, is virtually undetectable in healthy healthy population. But since we deal with other patients also, its level may be elevated in patients with systemic vasculitis. So in patients with anchor-associated vasculitis, it will not be much useful. That you, you should know. And Kawasaki, other doctors So uh, you, should, you should know these things. So basically, procalcitonin is to differentiate from back to if, if it is elevated, it's suggestive of bacterial infection. CD64. It's where CD62 is nothing but AC gamma receptor one, and the, its function is that it will it's the AC part of the antibody. So basically, it's the part, part is phagocytosis and uh, of, of the it helps in the phagocytosis of the antigen and uh, oxygenization of the antigen. Expression is low in low in neutrophil. We weakly express on the neutrophil in the basal condition, but when the neutrophil gets gets stimulus, it levelizes. So in presence of infection, the level increases on the neutrophil and Theoretically, also it looks very good. So, because it will have the fast cells to go to the site of infection within few hours, and it has been calculated that if the index in CD64 is more than 2.2, it's a good indicator for bacterial infection, and uh, uh, it's a very stable. So, we can keep the blood for uh, almost. We can wait for almost 30 hours. It's stable for about 30 hours, and done by flow cytometry. And uh, there is a study by Dr. Bigan Shagarwal. And they did. They looked at this in patients with actually also in patients with anchor-associated vasculitis. So they have uh, 51 active patients with active disease and 25 infection. But they included patients with anchor-associated vasculitis also. And what they found, what they found was that the CD4 expression was high in patients with infection. It's significantly high with infection in CD as compared to patients with active disease. So in infection, level was high. But they took patients both ethyl as well as anchor-associated vasculitis. So it's a very good marker, theoretically also, practically also. But other study, other things are also there. Uh, the studies are also there, which are on the contrary also. Now I shall. These are the common. I think these, these markers are very important and should be used in the day-to-day -day clinical practice. But there are certain markers. Which I should say there are investigational markers which we may, which may be using, which may be we be wanting to do studies to uh, differentiate uh, ethyl patients with flare from infections. And one of them is HMG B1, high mobility group chromosome binding protein 1. It's a non histone nuclear DNA binding protein. And when there is infection in, in tissue immunity or uh, infection, they trans translocate from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, and from there they are released into the extracellular space and the level rises. So it might be a marker, however, we don't have any cutoff. It's, a, it's an investigational molecule. Somebody, if you, somebody wants to do a study, you can do a study on this. CD7 plus. CD27 plus B cells. So B cells, as you know, are very important in the pathogenesis of lupus. And these CD27 positive B cells, they are basically uh, B cells which secrete a lot of anti, easily stimulated to secrete a lot of antibodies. And the level is high in the ethyl patients. Again, not much studies are available, but again, it's an investigational molecule. Two prime, five prime oligoadenylate synthetase. It's an enzyme involved with the degradation of DNA, and it gives it basically it cleaves the viral viral RNA. And thereby prevent from the viral infection. And again, it's a promising molecule which might be uh, usually levels are low in patients with active active lupus. However, variability are there. Managed binding lectin, uh, again, uh, an investigation of molecule, and, and we can look at it. Studies are not that much. And this is the lactic lectin pathway to, to, to remind you. So, lectins basically they recognize the carbohydrate deciduous on the microbes and uh, and along with the like, managed binding lectin associated serine protease, they activate the complement. That is the lectin pathway of complement activation. Next investigational uh, marker is delta neutrophil index. Basically, it's a marker, uh, it, it measures the immature neutrophil fraction. So, it is determined by subtracting the fraction of mature poly polymorphonuclear leukocytes from the myeloparathyroid reactive cells. So, from all the neutrophils, you, you subtract the mature neutrophils. What you are left with is immature neutrophils. So when there is infection, we expect that the number of immature neutrophils should be more. So it's, it's based on that. In presepsin, it's nothing but uh, the part of the CD14 uh, uh, CD14 molecule. It's a uh, soluble antiviral fragment of the CD14, and 
it is released into the plasma after bacterial infection uh, and uh, it, it level rises it's a marker of sepsis and also being used in ocular patient again it, somebody can study on this molecule and in this study uh, they looked at the crp highly highly sensitive crp serum procalcitonin and uh, the pricepsin hcrp is nothing but uh, it's a method by which you can you can measure very low amount of crp that is that, that's why it is called hcrp and most of the crp which we measure most of the labs they measure the high, highly sensitive crp only so for us hcrp and crp is are synonymous and if you look at that hcrp and procalcitonin better than the the the, the, the P precepsin. So, because the area under the curve is much higher uh, in, in, for HSCRP and Procal as compared to precepsin. So, again, it does not seem to be very, very promising, but again, it's an invasion molecule. It requires to be studied. So this is uh, uh, some kind of summary I have made for you of different uh, investigational markers for which you can do, you can do studies. Now, because the individual markers, that there can be, uh, uh, basically, there are different kinds of findings. Some studies say it's, in, it's useful. Some studies say it's not useful. So, like, there's a study which says that procalcitonin level may not be useful in ACL patient with in bacterial infection. So, people have done the composite score. So, it looks at uh, different, different parameters together and they make a score. One is called risk calculator, calculator I shall talk later on. And there's another called bioscope, which is a composite of procalcitonin, the CD, CD64, and STEM. STEM1. And coming to the risk cast calculator, it was developed by Shara Becker. And in this regression analysis, they, they found that days of fever, CRP level, anti DHN antibody level, based on this, they can, they can say what is the probability of flare. So CRP, they have, they have done medium, low, high. DHN also, they have said medium, low. They have said medium, low, high. And then they have developed this kind of and, and scores and Excel sheet, number of days of fever, anti DHN, antibody titer, CRP level, and then they give a probability score. And there's a study by Dr. Amita Agarwal, uh, in the ACL uh, abstractly presented this. So 42 episodes of infection in 40 ACL patients, and uh, 22 patients had, uh, had flare, 18 had only infection, two had both infection plus flare, and they, they found out that. The CD64 we are talking about, which theoretically seems to be very promising also, they did, she did not find much different of the CD64 expression in neutrophil uh, between patients with infection and, and disease flare, and also for MRP also. The, uh, the, the, they did not find it, she did not find it different. But the, she, then they looked at the, the, uh, this composite index, which is the, uh, of days of fever, CRP, and DHN level, and they found that this curve, it's a, a good curve, and since that this the sensitivity will be say, around 80%, and if we drop down here, it will come to about say 85%. So 80% sensitivity over 85% sensitivity is quite good. So the composite in this in our study seems to be good in differentiating acylation from infection. And this is a study by doc, Dr. Lijar Ayashekar from, from Hyderabad, and they not only looked at infection flare, but they also looked at infection plus flare. Uh, the, though the sample size is very low, but they found that that N three sixty four that the uh, that fraction is high in, in in infection as compared to disease flare, and patients those who have infection plus flare plus flare they had even higher level. So basically, C T sixty four could be a very promising marker in a, a marker in differentiating actually patients from infections. And I shall finish with another case. And which we recently, which we saw a few, few years back only. So she was diagnosed as, as a silly in probably in Chennai. She went there, she had fever, arthritis, all ulcer, skin rash, ANA, DSGNA positive, low complement. So she was diagnosed as lupus and she was started on high dose steroid plus hydroxychloroquine. I don't know why she was given such a high dose of steroid, but the result was good. At the end of two years, she was in remission on penicillin 10 milligram, 2.5 milligram alternate day and hydroxychloroquine. So she was very, very fine. But then she suddenly developed uh, the flare. Fever, malaria, rash, high grade fever for one month, size to a flare. The local physician treated her with- Dr. Ghosh, please finish. Uh, so this patient is important to show that- One or two minutes. She had headache and vomiting. And uh, what we found was that she had pediocytosis in the CSF. 
and the uh, compliments are low the leukopenia was there and we did not and share was repeatedly on the uh, repeatedly low cultures are all the time negative so we thought that could be new psychiatric lupus we did we give uh, high dose steroid 40 mg steroid but what happened that people fever became even more and we thought she is having acidic meningitis but ultimately uh, if you look at the csa which was done so 75 cells later on csa was done so 50 cells and and we do repeated ferritin ferritin became very high and all the cultures all the time all the neg are negative so we are doing ferritin very regularly so we found that basically she was having macro ejaculation syndrome so macro ejaculation syndrome is one condition where if you give steroids like 50 mg 20 mg steroids it may not be sufficient to control the fever this patient will not respond so this patient required very high dose of steroid basically they required methyl penicillin patient was given methyl penicillin and and, and she responded so that's all thank you thank you uh, dr prasad ghosh for giving such a comprehensive uh, talk you going from the simple biomarkers to uh, more uh, uh, more newer uh, biomarkers and the bio scores and everything you have covered it at a length and uh, i think most of the questions which have been asked have been answered by you in the talk itself so, uh, but i will uh, put one or two questions difference between crp and high sensitivity C CRP, which one is better, by Prashant Ch Chotalia? Highly sensitive CRP, basically, it's a method by which we can detect even very, very low amount of CRP. So CRP, that's what is high, highly sensitive. We do it by nephrometry. We do it by uh, monoclonal antibody to the CRP, anti specific antibody to the CRP, and that measures highly, highly sensitive CRP. So most of the labs now do highly sensitive. So now it, it has become almost synonymous: highly sensitive CRP and CRP. Any newer uh, biomarkers you have already told infections. Often trigger a flare, making the use of parameters difficult. You have already covered it. And then, uh, tissue and blood cultures by Dr. Rohini Samant. She is asking for the tissue and blood cultures. Yeah, uh, that I miss obviously, but thing is that obviously all the time we have to do cultures. Whenever the whatever we suspect social infection, you have to do cultures. Cultures is the one thing, and sometimes we miss stuff like sinusitis. You have missed. As a cause of fever, we have missed UTI most of the time. It's a very common infection, so all the time urine culture is required and also blood culture. So cultures all the time. It's a very good, very good suggestion which I missed. And now uh, the last question by Dr. Ankur Ankur Dalal: Does CRP and ESR CRP ratio also help in suspecting acute viral infection other than COVID-19 in SLE? Yes, they are mostly studied for bacterial infections. I don't have any. I don't. I don't know because I am not treating. I have not treated a single patient of COVID, so I can't okay. I can tell you. But it's. I think it's more important for bacterial infection. For viral infection, it may not be that useful. Okay. Thank you so much for this uh, comprehensive talk, Dr. Prasad Ghosh. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So after a very informative talk by Dr. Prasad Ghosh, now we move on to the fourth lecture. of this evening which is very very important the acr ular classification criteria of 2019 Do professor david d cruz he will be talking about this and he is md frcp consultant rheumatologist louis coot lupus unit guys and st thomas's hospital london professor d cruz is clinical team lead of this internationally renowned tertiary referral center for autoimmune rheumatic disorders his major clinical and research interests are systemic lupus erythematosus the anti phospholipid syndrome and systemic vasculitis he leads the glowy coat lupus clinical trials unit which has a portfolio of investigator and industry led trials he is closely involved with undergraduate and postgraduate teaching and training professor d cruz has published widely including peer reviewed papers and book chapters he has given plenary uh, lectures at national and international rheumatology and internal medicine conferences he is one of the managing editors of the journal lupus and regularly reviews for major scientific journals and he will be apprising us about the latest acr ular classification criteria of 2019 clarity or confusion and as we all know this criteria has better specificity as compared to the slick criteria of 2012 and sensitivity is also equal to the slick criteria 
So now over to Professor David D. Cruz for the lecture. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you very much indeed for the invitation to uh, give this lecture. And I have to congratulate the organizers, especially Professor Alakanda Ghosh, for very astutely picking this uh, rather controversial topic for me to, to speak on. These are my disclosures. Um, um, so we all, the whole topic is about lupus. Uh, we know this is a spectrum of disease ranging from mild to moderate to severe disease. Um, and uh, we know a lot more. We don't know entirely about the pathogenesis, but we know quite a lot about the pathogenesis and cause of lupus. There are various environmental triggers that are on the slide here, sunlight, drugs, chemicals, smoking, certain viruses. There's clearly a genetic component to um, increasing the risk for lupus. And we've heard already about defective apoptosis and netosis uh, providing the anti antigenic drive uh, for lupus. So in the clinic, um, there are phases to the disease. There's the preclinical phase where the patient is perfectly well, but they are making autoantibodies, including the lupus autoantibodies, but they are very well. Then something triggers the change from preclinical autoimmunity to clinical disease, and we're all very familiar with this um, uh, in, in the clinic with organ involvement, flares, damage, and the comorbidities eventually leading to premature morbidity and mortality. So um, diagnosis is what we do every day. Um, it's based on careful clinical assessment. Uh, you have to listen to the patient. The patients often have many, many symptoms and you have to try and make sense of these symptoms. And after the open questions, you do. it's worth um, using a structured list of questions for symptoms. And then nobody leaves my clinic without being examined fully um, for all the organ systems. And then your laboratory investigations are aimed at uh, identifying evidence of immune reactivity and obviously organ inflammation and dysfunction. So the aims of diagnosis, we're all very familiar with this, to identify patients with cutaneous or systemic lupus. Uh, once you've made the diagnosis, you can plan treatment and monitoring, and then you can give an indication of prognosis and outcome. So the methods are basically bedside clinical judgment. Uh, it's a skillful, um, it requires a lot of skill in assimilating many clinical, pathological, and serological variables. Um, and uh, the diagnosis may be questioned later on the line by your colleagues or by new data, and you may have to revise the diagnosis. It really is an art to diagnosing patients with lupus. Diagnosis, if you make a diagnosis of lupus, it opens doors. Um, the patient feels empowered. If they've got a diagnosis, they can seek uh, knowledge and education. Um, the clinicians can provide a clinical management plan, uh, which can result in imp improved quality of life. Uh, a diagnosis gives you access to long-term healthcare, uh, gives you access to benefits, and it gives you um, access to social support. If you fail to make a diagnosis, uh, the doors close. Your symptoms are generally ignored or attributed to other conditions. Uh, treatment is denied, and this leads to a lot of psychological morbidity and distress uh, with patients. So this slide, I think, is worth um, talking about in diagnosis and classification. Uh, this is an interesting study published very recently, um, a few years ago, a large study in, from China, 20,000 healthy volunteers, autoimmune disease patients were specifically excluded. And this was just looking at the prevalence of anti-nuclear antibodies at various titers, low titers of one in 100 or one in 320. And you can see that as we get older, the, the prevalence of uh, anti-nuclear antibodies rise as we get older because of uh, breakdown of torrents. Uh, interestingly, the top three antibodies that were found in this study were, we would think, were very specific, Rho52, mitochondrial M2, and SSA antibodies, uh, but none of these patients had any diseases uh, or documented diseases. Uh, but we also know that um, from Melissa Arbuckle's famous study from the New England Journal of Medicine, that anti-nuclear antibodies, and indeed some of these lupus antibodies, can predate the diagnosis of lupus by many years. So this leads to a problem. Uh, and the risk here is overdiagnosis. So you have a, a patient referred to you with a positive ANA and you search hard um, and there's not a very good correlation between the clinical features and this positive ANA. And indeed, this is where I, we talk about a pretest probability for lupus. So if you misjudge the pretest probability for lupus, uh, you may end up overdiagnosing the patients uh, with lupus when they don't actually have lupus, they just have a positive ANA uh, and some non-specific symptoms and this can lead to overtreatment, inappropriate referrals, adverse events from your treatments, psychological harm from a wrong diagnosis, and obviously societal costs. So uh, this is a real skill making a diagnosis to get it right. 
So what about diagnostic criteria? Well, there have never been diagnostic criteria for lupus, and I don't think there's any chance of diagnostic criteria coming around anytime soon. This would be a pretty enormous task um, to do. Classification criteria, on the other hand, have evolved since the first uh, uh, um, American Rheumatology Association criteria from 1971. So the aim of classification criteria, not diagnostic criteria, the aim of classification criteria is to accurately identify homogeneous patient cohorts primarily for research. The methods of classification are based on agreed objective criteria, and they are very, very highly specific classification criteria, but not sensitive um, uh, when compared to a clinical diagnosis. And very importantly, and this is emphasized a lot, uh, the fulfillment of classification criteria is not necessary for diagnosis of SLE. So in other words, you can make a clinical diagnosis of SLE uh, and that patient may not necessarily fulfill all the classification criteria. And that's quite a, a, a tricky concept. So classification criteria, the first one was 1971 ARA classification criteria uh, with a sensitivity of 90% and a specificity of 90%, 99% when compared uh, with rheumatoid arthritis. The 1982 revision, uh, the sensitivity and specificity were again very good, 96% um, uh, looking at 177 lupus patients and control patients. Uh, and everybody is very familiar with the AC, the old ACR classification criteria. Um, you needed four of the 11 criteria to classify a patient uh, with lupus. Then came along the 2012 SIC, SLIC classification criteria, a very big set of uh, data set uh, uh, organized by Michelle Petrie. Again, four criteria needed, uh, and you can see the sensitivity and specificity have improved compared to the ACR classification criteria. SLIC had a 97% sensitivity and 84% specificity. So things are improving. And these are the SLIC classification criteria. A big difference here was that you had to have at least one immunological criterion with at least one clinical criterion. Uh, it seemed nonsensical to classify somebody with lupus who did not have any antibodies. So that was remedied in this uh, classification criteria. And then we come to the topic of uh, this lecture, the ACR ULAR classification criteria. Um, another enormous body of work led by Martin Arringer from Germany. Uh, and they postulated that the classification criteria I've just described work well in established disease, but new onset disease had not previously been included. And that was one of the aims of this study. Uh, they also used improved classification methodology, uh, expert-based and data-driven methods, in, and inclusion, importantly, inclusion of the patient perspective, which was not present in the previous studies. Uh, and again, just like the SLIC criteria, positive ANA was a mandatory entry criterion. And then they um, moved on to use weighted criteria. So here are the weighted criteria. You must have a positive ANA of at least one in 80 to get it, uh, a classification uh, of lupus. And then they weighted uh, the items here, as you can see in the clinical domains, uh, and you have to take the highest scoring uh, item in that domain. Uh, so for example, class three or four lupus nephritis scored 10, and that scored highest. Uh, and then you've got the immunological domains that I've described on the slide here. So one in 80, you had to have an ANA of one in 80 to uh, enter the classification criteria. If you don't have an ANA, you do not classify that patient with um, uh, lupus. Uh, and, and I've covered all this just now. So uh, if we just compare the criteria, this is the ACR, this is sensitivity, specificity, and the combined, um, you can see that there have been improvements uh, over the years. Critics would argue, well, okay, there are improvements, but they're not that great improvements uh, compared from the 2019 ULI ACR criteria with the uh, 1997 criteria, and I'll come back to that. So I think the key thing here when using classification criteria is you have to have a high pretest probability of lupus. So in other words, you must have a suspicion of SLE before you begin to use the classification criteria. Uh, and once you enter the classification criteria, you've got, um, sorry, um, you've got uh, the four, uh, the, the three criteria I've just mentioned, the ACR, four of 11, the SLIC, you can have lupus nephritis on a biopsy with a positive ANA or DNA or four of the 17 criteria, and then the ACR ULAR criteria, you must have a positive ANA, and then use the weighted scoring uh, system. So cutaneous lupus, um, you have classification criteria for um, cutaneous lupus. These are all embodied within the previous classification criteria, acute cutaneous lupus, discoid lupus, SCLE, chill lupus, and 
uh, lupus paniculitis. Um, and these have all been very carefully defined in both the SLIC and the ACR ULAR uh, criteria. Uh, so you need to go to the uh, glossary for these classification criteria for these definitions. Neuropsychiatric lupus is very challenging. Uh, so we, we all see these patients, hallucination and psychosis is the extreme end of the spectrum and seizures, uh, you, standard treatment approaches. There's no trials in this area, but this is what we use. Neuropsychiatric lupus is complex. It's poorly understood uh, and difficult to diagnose with certainty. And at the moment, uh, neuropsychiatric lupus is excluded from all the clinical trials. These are the classification criteria for the, from the ACR, 19 distinct syndromes, and these are not necessarily specific for lupus, and not all of them need immunosuppression. So what about the, the topic of this um, uh, lecture? So diagnosis versus classification. So classification is easy. It's binary. Uh, the patient either meets the criterion or does not meet the criteria, whichever criteria you choose to use. The problem here is that diagnosis is not binary. We're all very familiar with lupus. I, I showed this earlier on. This is a, a huge spectrum of symptoms and signs and, and tests. Um, and it, it, they're a very heterogeneous group of patients. And it does need a lot of clinical judgment to make a diagnosis uh, of lupus. Then comes the probability of confusing diagnostic labels. And you, we've all heard these and indeed probably used them incomplete lupus, undifferentiated connective tissue disease, undifferentiated autoimmune rheumatic disease, lupus-like illness, overlap and mixed connective tissue disease. The difficulty here is that patients don't meet classification criteria, they won't be recruited into clinical trials. So classification opens doors. Enrollment into clinical trials, research databases, and certainly in the UK, uh, if you meet the classification criteria for lupus, you will be eligible for new treatments, uh, for example, belimumab. By contrast, if the classification criteria are not met, your patients will be excluded from clinical trials, they'll be excluded from research, and they may well be excluded from, from new therapies, depending on how strict uh, your governing criteria are. So um, people have begun critiques of classification criteria. Uh, I've just shown you that there have been only very small incremental changes since the first criteria in 1971. Um, and some people are arguing, and this is a very, very nice review article here from John Reynolds and Ian Bruce published last month. Uh, uh, they argue that in the absence of diagnostic criteria, uh, it may be that classification criteria are no longer fit for purpose. And that's quite a radical thing to say in this day and age. They argue that maybe uh, after all these 40 years or, of classification criteria, maybe we're just rearranging the deck chairs and not making much progress. So um, this is another very, very good uh, review in Annals of Rheumatic Diseases published last month from Duncan Porter, um, are asking for a, a time for a rethink uh, of classification criteria. So one concept, uh, so the classification criteria I've told you are mainly to recruit patients into clinical trials. So you recruit lupus patients into lupus trials, Sjogren's patients into Sjogren's trials, ankyovasculitis patients into ankyovasculitis trials. A different model would be to classify patients according to the cellular or molecular pathways. And this I think is very attractive, but there are also challenges, but it's very attractive. So for example, you can group together B cell driven diseases, lupus, Sjogren's, inflammatory myositis, ankyovasculitis, group them all into one trial and um, use B cell driven, B cell um, appropriate therapies, rituximab, belimumab, uh, oculizumab, and others. So it's sort of a, a bucket type approach. So put all your conditions into one trial and use, for example, rituximab. Uh, another approach is the type 1 interferon signature. So you could group patients with the type 1 interferon signature, uh, for example, lupus, Sjogren's, overlap syndromes, and then put them into a trial and um, investigate uh, interferon-directed therapies, for example, anifrolumab uh, compared to placebo. And then, of course, you can also group complement-mediated disease, the classic one being lupus. And now it's now recognized that ankyovasculitis is a complement-mediated disease, so you can put all these diseases together um, and run a randomized control trial of, for example, evacapan or eclizumab versus um, uh, placebo. So obviously the challenges with this approach of classifying according to cellular and molecular pathways is what do you do with organ threatening disease like lupus nephritis? Uh, and then measuring treatment response and outcomes in a bucket trial with all these diseases will be very challenging. However, the ultimate aim is uh, trying to achieve what we all want to do is personalized medicine for your patient, giving the right drug to the right patient uh, at the right time. So the type, title of this topic chosen by the organizers was ACR, ULAR classification criteria, clarity or confusion. 
So I think there is some clarity. There's been incremental progress since 1971 criteria. Uh, we now have very good sensitivity and specificity criteria for classification. Um, but there's a lot of confusion around the use and misuse of classification criteria. They're often misused for di diagnosis, which is which can be disastrous because classification are not meant to be used for diagnosis. Uh, and when you come to diagnosis, there's a whole array of confusing diagnostic labels. And then another big criticism of classification criteria is that if your patient obviously has lupus in your opinion, but they don't meet the classification criteria, they will not get into a clinical trial and they be, may be excluded from, from new treatments. So I think people are beginning to ask uh, a question now, uh, is there a time for new approaches? So these are all my colleagues who've helped you in the, in the lupus unit. So um, thank you very much for your attention for this very short talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor De Cruz, for this comprehensive talk. Uh, now there is only clarity, no confusion. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Uh, Any questions the, from our audience? Lost my I think the, the things are so clear that uh, there is no question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Well, there is there is one um, uh, Professor Cruz, if I may say, one comment by Dr. Rohini Saman saying that in countries like India, where you have serocytes um, uh, due to reasons like tuberculosis infections, you could cause confusion if that is included in the diagnostic yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the classification criteria. So, any yeah. comments um, on that? Yeah. So again, this comes to bedside clinical judgment. Um, what is driving the serocytis? Is it lupus or is it infection? Uh, and that really it done, comes down to clinical judgment. I, I think classification criteria have no role to play here at the bedside here. You've got somebody who's really sick with pluripericardial effusion. They could have tuberculosis. They could have other infections uh, or they could have infusion, uh, uh, lupus or both, as we just heard from the previous talk. So this is a very clinical judgment, I think. Uh, I think there's no role for classification criteria at the bedside. And the other question is uh, on DFS um, 70, if, if uh, that mm. is used to be specific for um, not having autoimmune disease, any comments on that? Uh? Yes, we don't have access to this uh, test in, in our hospital, so I've got very little experience of it. I know it's very controversial. There's a lot of publications on DFS 70, um, but I have little experience of it, so I don't really feel I can comment on that. Others may be more qualified to do that. But David, at this moment, we don't accept ANA negative lupus so for the, even if uh, fulfills yeah. clinical criteria. For classification, not. Yeah, for classification, not. For the ACR, ULR classification, if you don't have an ANA, you don't get classified. But we all recognize there are uh, small numbers of patients, less than 5% of uh, lupus patients, that have a negative ANA, but they often have other antibodies. Uh, you know, uh, we certainly, it is well recognized, you can have ANA negative but row positive lupus, uh, and there are other antibodies around um, that can make, so somebody who's got a clinical picture for lupus, and it's obvious to you at the bedside that this is lupus, it's somewhat disconcerting to see a negative ANA. Um, but in my experience, if you search, uh, there are other antibodies that come up, row 60, row 52, uh, uh, and row antibodies can come up in ANA negative lupus, but they're a small minority. Uh, and I think this is a big issue, ANA negative, it's very controversial, ANA negative lupus, but I, I think there's a tiny role for recognizing some of these patients, sure. But they wouldn't get into clinical trials. That's the difficulty. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I, yeah. With that, I think I'd um, I'd like to thank uh, take this opportunity to thank the speakers, Professor Cruz, uh, Professor Anil Abraham for their excellent deliberations, uh, our own Dr. Chingappa, Dr. Parashar Ghosh uh, for for the deliberations today, for making things clear. Also, the moderators, Professor Enu Saigal and Dr. Jyot Das, uh, for moderating these sessions. Just just maybe we need to. Uh, be on time so that the next speaker can, you know, do justice to his talk and have more question answers. That is something that the speakers uh, have to see. Um, and regarding the question answers, I think we've had so many questions and I think it might be uh, Professor Alkindu sir, and we've, we've discussed this before also, and Shanoi also that we maybe we need to pull in those questions and have a question bank and either send it to the speakers or team of from some of us experts who can actually answer these questions and we can put it up on the web somewhere. Also, one more question being asked to me has been uh, if uh, we can have a recording of this. And yes, we will have the recorded sessions of all of this and we'll put it up on the website of the IRA so all of you can log in there. Uh, I'd also take this opportunity to thank CIPLA today who have been our partners for uh, sponsoring this session. And, um, and with an invitation to come tomorrow, we have some really good sessions by uh, Professor Anisur, Abraham, Anisur Rahman and uh, 
Dr. Arun Mishra, Arun, and also Dr. Liza, and Dr. Ranjan Gupta. So I think uh, all of you are welcome tomorrow. Please join in uh, tomorrow at about um, 6.45, 6.50 for the very interesting session, more on management of lupus, uh, um, uh, which is something which is being, uh, you know, we need to be updated almost every day on that, every month on that. With that, I thank you, all of you. Good night. Thank um, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>